everybody, and welcome to this week's Wildlife Wednesday Weekly Roundup. I'm your host, Tenley Thompson, and boy do we have some fantastic video footage to show you this week. The way this is going to work is we're going to show you all the videos our guides and naturalists have been taking throughout the week in the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Then, at the end of the broadcast, I'm going to give you a chance to win a $10 gift card to our EcoTour store by answering our trivia question of the week. Lastly, I'll be answering your questions live. So if you've got a good question for me that's naturalist, wildlife biology, Grand Teton, Yellowstone related, go ahead and start typing the comments, typing your question in the comments section now. But let's go ahead and get started with the biggest news of the week, which was a really great view of our most favorite and beloved bear, Grizzly Bear 399. Look at running up the top. Hey there, this is Sarah with EcoTour Adventures and we're on our first day of a multi-day trip and we've been lucky enough to get word that 399 and her four cubs are up on the hillside. So we've taken a few videos with our phone scope and now we're just enjoying the experience of watching them. I think it's really important in the 21st century now to see things with our naked eye as well as through the phone. We've had a very lucky morning so far, especially considering how sunny it is. Often the direct sunlight can be uh, intense for the wildlife and they tend to seek cover as it gets too warm. So we were very lucky to get word that our grand matriarch of Grand Teton National Park, Grizzly number 399, has come out uh, with all four cubs. And all four cubs look good and 399 has put on a little weight since the last time I saw her, which is a good sign that um, she's going to go into hibernation well. We still have a long ways to go before she goes into hibernation, but it looks like she's doing well so far. For those of you who don't join us every week, I should do a little bit of introduction. Grizzly Bear 399 is arguably the most famous grizzly bear in the world, and at 24 years old, she's actually had quite a few cubs in her lifetime. Um, this set of four is only her latest. She's also had three rounds of triplets and she's beloved for not only her ability to raise multiple cubs, which is very difficult and very rare, but also for the fact that she does so so successfully year after year, even into old age. Now you can see that a lot of these cubs are actually quite a bit lighter than their mother. That's actually really quite typical of 399's cubs. And of cubs in general, they blend in a little bit more into their surroundings when they're slightly lighter colored, and they do tend to darken with age. In addition, Grizzly 399's typical mate, uh, which we did witness mating with her to produce these cubs, is a slightly lighter colored bear. Um, over the years, we've seen some of her very, very light colored bear cubs become quite dark by the time they're two or three years old. So it'll be interesting to see if these four, if they survive to subadulthood, follow that same pattern. Now, research suggests that grizzly bear cubs typically have about a 50% mortality rate in the wild uh, before the age of two years old. Luckily, Grizzly Bear 399's cubs typically do have a slightly higher survival rate than that, but um, we're all hopeful that these four cubs will continue to thrive and do well as they prepare for hibernation. Grizzly Bear 399 and these four cubs, as well as her 14-year-old daughter, Grizzly Bear 610, and her two cubs have been putting on quite a show this week. And the vast majority of our trips have had an opportunity to see either one or the other. We're going to have plenty more footage of these guys for you next week as well. But I think our guide, Laura, put it best when she was out filming these animals with her guests. I mean, this is just so great. It's hard to leave this behind. <laughs> I know. Do you not normally get this good a shot of them? You know, there is no normal for us. Yeah. Um, we try yeah. our best every time, but sometimes we find her and mm. sometimes we don't. To see any grizzly bear is a once in a lifetime opportunity, but I know there were lots of happy folks out there this week to see both her and the cubs doing quite well. 
and uh, we look forward to their future antics. Now, the vast majority of grizzlies are up in the high country right now, eating army cutworm moths in the scree, the high boulder fields of the Teton and Grovant ranges. These two are mostly down using uh, huckleberries and other berry resources to fatten up for preparation of winter hibernation. As we make our way into late summer and fall here in the Tetons, we anticipate that we'll have more views of both 399 and her daughter 610 making use of all the different berry crops as they come into season on the valley floor. So we'll continue to keep you updated on this crew and uh, we have plenty more footage that we just got this morning and as well as yesterday evening that we'll have for you next week as well. How awesome was that? So Susan, to answer your question, what on earth are they chomping on? They're mowing down berries. And when a grizzly bear mows down berries, they eat the berries, the twig, the leaves, they eat the whole branch of whatever it is that they're eating. There's a couple things that are pretty heavily in bloom right now. Huckleberries are all over the place and have been pretty much stripped by birds and bears and all sorts of different animals in the ecosystem. I was trying to find some for my guests last night and it took me a couple minutes because every single branch was stripped bare. Utah twin honeysuckle is still um, out there as is a couple different things like twisted stockberry and, and some other berries that we can't uh, necessarily eat but bears can as well as early choke cherry is also starting to come out as well. So. Um, as our berry season progresses and we begin to see more and more of these, uh, it's going to be it's going to be a good year for berries. I can already tell we're going to have lots more views of these grizzly bears, and we'll be bringing them along to you every week on Wednesdays. Okay, let's shift gears from our predators to our herbivores and take a look at a unique situation that presented itself where two guides were actually present, and I'll let them tell the story. Let's check in. Hi, this is Laura. A few mornings ago, myself and guide Sarah Ernst had the chance to see a lovely mama moose and her two twin calves feasting on bitter brush, a local plant that grows out in the sagebrush flats in Western Wyoming. At Ecotour Adventures, we like to work as a team. So I was in the neighborhood and we got a radio call that there was some good action up ahead. So myself and my guests got to the location as quickly as possible to get great views of that moose in front of a backdrop of the sunrise in the Tetons. Hello, this is Sarah from Ecotour Adventures and we're in some really good moose habitat here having a picnic breakfast on one of our multi-day trips on the edge of the Snake River, just on the southern border of Yellowstone. And yesterday we had an amazing experience with a female moose and her twin calves. One of the benefits of having guided here for as many years as I have is that I know where all the signs and the big dark rocks are. So when I see a sign or a big dark rock that looks out of place, I know to investigate it, see if it might be a moose. And we were, um, able to to pull up and use the roof hatches to get a nice intimate experience with this moose and her calves as the sunlight was hitting the Tetons. Moose usually just have one calf of the year but in this case she had two which happens about 10 percent of the time. The moose were coming out to this ecosystem the sagebrush habitat to feed on antelope bitterbrush. Uh, antelope bitterbrush grows only in certain areas of the valley. It needs just the right soil conditions. But for a moose, it's quite a find. It's one of the highest protein browses available to them. So they are able to you know, fill themselves up with it, gain some muscle mass, gain some body fat for the winter. I imagine for a moose, after eating a lot of willows all summer long, being able to come out in the cooler temperatures of these August mornings and feed on the bitter brush is like having a T-bone steak after living off of lettuce for a long time. It must be very satisfying to the moose. After the great sighting, myself and my guests pulled over. I made up some hot drinks for them, which took a little time. And then I noticed that the moose and those two lovely calves 
or heading towards the main highway, which could, for them could be a dangerous place to cross. So I took my van and my guests to the highway road, roadside to slow down traffic. I put on my hazard signals and then you know, ensured that the mama moose and those calves safely made it across. In Wyoming, big game crossings are a frequent event. <laughs> I advise motorists to be extra careful as they drive around our roads in Western Wyoming, and keeping a heads up for those big animals crossing the highway. Believe it or not, even though moose are really big, they can be sneaky. She came up from the left side of the road uh, onto the road surface without much notice. In 2019, the state of Wyoming put out new wildlife conservation license plates. These plates are for sale to residents to generate revenue for better wildlife crossings. So bridges and tunnels alongside fences to bottleneck an animals to specific crossing points and to fund uh, mowing and signage along the roadside to make animals more visible. As the sun was coming up, it got too hot and the moose was able to safely cross the highway and get to the shade of the forest. Um, but remember to keep your eye open for moose when you are um, on these bitter brush fields and these cooler mornings. Now, did you know that one in 15 deaths in the state of Wyoming is due to a wildlife collision? In five years time from 2011 until 2016, there were over 23,000 carcasses removed from our roadsides. 17,608 carcasses belong to mule deer. I think that's too many. These, these wildlife conservation license plates come to us from a uh, push by the, the Yellowstone Coalition and the Muley, Found, Muley Fanatics Foundation and they were able to push that through in Cheyenne just a couple years ago. So thank you to those organizations. We've been the supporter of the program, purchasing plates for all of our vehicles in our fleet. So a great tip when wildlife are crossing a road is you don't want to just go get right where they're trying to cross. Try to get yourself a little bit further back. Give them some room to get across the road. Easy to do, but certainly sometimes in our enthusiasm for seeing wildlife, as you can see with those cars there, not always successful. But on another note, where is everybody joining us from? I've been seeing a lot of folks in the comment section commenting. So far, I'm pretty darn excited. We've got Jorge from um, Argentina and Mabithi from Nairobi, Kenya, who are joining us live, which makes me, um, I'm pretty excited about that. That's pretty amazing that folks all over the world are getting an opportunity to see us. What a time we live in that I can broadcast this live from Jackson, Wyoming, and it can reach so far away. So thank you guys for joining us from near and far. Let us know in the comments section where you're joining us from. And in addition, we'd love to know if um, watching these videos has inspired you to come to Jackson Hole or um, even maybe come on a trip with us. We provide them as a public service. They're there for everybody to enjoy, to really understand this wonderful place that we live in. But if you plan on visiting Jackson or you plan on booking a trip anytime in the future, whether it's two years from now or in a week, do let the staff at our Eco Tour Adventures office know that you watch these broadcasts and we'll go ahead and we'll give you 10% off any booking that you make with us. And that includes things like our full, fall multi-day trips that are coming up um, where we have all these great opportunities for wolves and grizzlies and some of these other things. So do be sure to mention that you watch these videos. We'll absolutely give you a discount for doing so. And we're so glad to have so many of you joining us. All right, back to the wildlife. You guys ready for some wolves? Cause I'm ready for some wolves. Let's check in with Kelsey who got a great view of a wolf in Grand Teton National Park this week. Hey guys, it's Kelsey and I want to talk to you today about wolves uh, because uh, last week on one of my tours I got some pretty sweet footage of a lone wolf wandering around in Grand Teton National Park. Now Grand Teton National Park actually didn't have wolves from the 1920s until 1999 
In fact, the entire Rocky Mountain West didn't have wolves beginning in the 1920s, and not again until 1995 uh, and 1996, when 44 wolves up in Canada were trapped and brought down to Yellowstone in the southern portions of Idaho and released. Now, those wolves established uh, multiple different territories and eventually gave birth to the population that we have today. Now, Grand Teton National Park's wolf population came back in 1999 when a mated pair uh, known as the Teton Pack established a territory in Grand Teton and gave birth to five pups. Now, I want to share with you guys some of my favorite facts about wolves, uh, facts that usually surprise people. Uh, the first one being that uh, wolves have a sh fairly short average lifespan, com at least short compared to what most people expect. Inside the national parks, particularly Yellowstone National Park, the average lifespan of a wolf is between four and six years. Outside the national parks in Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming, that lifespan is much shorter. It's actually only two to three years, and that is due to uh, hunting. Hunting is legal. Hunting and trapping of wolves is legal outside the national parks in those three states. So 80% of their mortality outside the national parks is due to human-induced factors, while 20% is naturally occurring. Now, if you reverse, uh, if you go into the national parks, then uh, those statistics are reversed. 80% of their mortality comes from natural causes inside the national parks, uh, the, with the biggest one being fights between wolf packs. They also can die in uh, hunting accidents. Um, they can get trampled. They can sustain life-threatening injuries. They can drown. Disease is also a factor. And then that remaining 20% is due to, unfortunately, poaching does occur sometimes. and uh, But most notably, um, vehicle collisions. Or th those are those human factors. Now, Yellowstone has studied wolf packs that have wolves that are six years old or older, and they found that those packs have a higher likelihood of winning in fights against other packs and they also have a higher success rate in their hunts and that is due to those older individuals passing down their knowledge and information to the younger wolves and i think that that is super super fascinating and i hope you do too all right pretty awesome view there we've got more wolf more grizzly content for you next week uh it's always a little struggle for me because i'll get content like on Wednesday at noon and I can't quite turn it around quick enough for you guys to see it this evening So we've got to send it on to the next week But lots of grizzly and wolf activity going on in both Grand Teton and Yellowstone this week Speaking of which it's not just grizzly bears in Grand Teton National Park. We have black bears, too Everybody always goes all crazy for the grizzly bears, but the black bears are just as cool and in some cases have just a completely different personality that can be absolutely charming. So let's check in with Elise, who got a great view of a black bear making use of that berry season this week. We spotted this gorgeous black bear on the shores of Jenny Lake. We were actually out on the lake that day. And he was feeding on berry bushes that were growing right along the lake shore there. This time of year are huckleberries, service berries, choke cherries, as well as a number of other berries are ripening up on those bushes right now. And the bears are definitely taking advantage of that delicious food source. Our black bears, when they're feeding this time of year, are generally completely absorbed in the act of eating and do not pay much mind to people that are walking by. But it's always a good reminder to remember to be bear aware when you're out hiking around Grand Teton National Park in Yellowstone. Make yourself known, carry bear spray, make some noise, let those bears know that you are in the vicinity. And that will help greatly reduce the chance of you and a bear surprising each other when you are out on the trail. Pretty good stuff. I can't watch one of those videos without just going om nom nom as they eat all of those berries. They are delicious. I used to make huckleberry jam for everyone in my family for Christmas every year and it was so much work picking those berries. If you've never had a chance to have our huckleberries, they're a local Rocky Mountain specialty. They only grow in the wild. You can't actually domesticate the plant and you have to go out there and pick them by hand. So if you ever get a chance, they taste like a cross between a raspberry and a blueberry, but maybe a little bit more sweet. And they're purple. They kind of look like purple blueberries. So pretty great stuff. Now, 
don't know if you guys have noticed this, but we've done something kind of neat this week up until now, which is every single video that you saw this week, every single interpretation that you had from a naturalist or a wildlife biologist this week was done by a woman. Did you notice? There's me, but there's all the other ladies who've contributed this week. It is, after all, the 100th anniversary of the right of women to vote, so I thought this would be a good week to definitely do that. Wyoming's nickname is the Equality State. We're actually the first state to grant women the vote um, in the United States. So as a proud Wyomingite, we definitely wanted to show you all the amazing wildlife biologists uh, that we have that are women. We have lots of men on staff and they're fantastic. We're going to show you some of those videos from them next. Um, but boy, when I got started in this industry, uh, when I was in school as a wildlife biologist, I was oftentimes the only woman in the room, which is quite common for a lot of folks who study in the STEM fields. It's so fantastic to see all these women coming up. And it's been so wonderful to guide trips with all of these young women and girls who are excited about going into science and excited about going into biology and wildlife biology. So if you've got any of those folks in the room who've got a question for me, I am here to answer questions, male or female, young or old definitely give me a comment in the comment section speaking of which we did have a question whether or not we'd have any more um fox footage in the future let's say you're asking if we have some fox i've got news for you remember one of those things i was talking about where i get it i don't have enough time to turn it around laura's got some great fox footage for us for next week so make sure you tune in for that and uh we'll try to get you as many of the canids foxes, coyotes, and wolves out of Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Park as we can. So thanks very much for that. But uh, in the meantime, let's let a guy into the mix. It's our old Wildlife Wednesday Roundup favorite, Josh, who's also one of our very, very best guides in terms of he leads our photography trips, our multi-day trips. He really is incredible and a very talented wildlife photographer to boot. He was up north and got a great view in the high country. So let's go check that out. Hi everyone, it's Josh Metten with Ecotour Adventures. I wanted to share with you a recent sighting that I had. Um, I was hiking out just outside of Yellowstone National Park with my friend Kira, and we looked up onto this really steep mountainside and saw a herd of cow elk. Um, it's a kind of a strange place where you wouldn't necessarily expect elk to be, but uh, it turns out that these elk were had traveled up across this snow field and were actually trying, it seems, to find a way up the mountainside. Uh, elk often travel high in elevation, especially during the heat of summer. It's cooler up there. They can avoid uh, insects like biting horse flies that might be bothering them. Um, and also even lie down in the snow to cool off. Um, in this instance, it seems like they were actually trying to find their way up and over the mountain and got a little bit off route. But it's a good example of just how tenacious and powerful they are and how they can travel through really steep and rugged terrain. Um, I was able to capture this footage from quite a ways away using my Maven binoculars and by carefully holding my phone up to it. So I hope you enjoyed this video and it makes you appreciate the amazing power of elk in the Crater Yellowstone ecosystem. All right, thanks to Josh for that. Really fun to see elk up high this time of year where the snow fields are still crisp. Boy, it's been hot this week. A snow field sounds pretty great. I have pretty good memories in my youth of sledding down some of our glaciers and snow fields uh, with a tarp while backpacking. But alas, I have been in the low country this week. Uh, I haven't been up high, but having a really good time out with guests, uh, enjoying all of the amazing wildlife, but it has been hot. So I thought I'd take some time and show you lots and lots of footage of all of our ungulates, our hoofed mammals, trying their best to stay cool in these high temperatures that we've been having. Let's check it out. It was an incredibly hot week for Jackson Hole this week with temperatures in the high 80s and even at one point in the low 90 degree temperatures. And heat is actually very difficult
for a lot of different wildlife in the high mountain, um, high desert environment that we live here in Jackson Hole and Yellowstone. Now, elk have a pretty interesting strategy. By nature, they are crepuscular. They're out at dawn and dusk, the cooler hours of the day. The bulls have mostly been staying up at high altitude, and when possible, moving up even to higher altitude. You can see this elk crossing the river to get into high country in Yellowstone, and these velvety bulls getting ready for the rut by eating as much as they can, grazing, getting ready to go, putting on that body fat now, elk actually only shed their coats once a year in the spring, and then throughout the summertime, they're actually growing their winter coat. So by the time we get into late August, that, that coat is getting pretty thick and heavy. So you either have to get up into the high country where it's cooler, or you really have to get into a shady area or an area where you can lower your overall body temperature. Now, the cow elk, uh, are not as fortunate. Those calves can't make it too high into the high country. And so they're down on the valley floor, uh, making the most of the cool mornings and evenings and finding water sources where they're available. Laura got a pretty fun view of these guys sporting about teaching the calves how to swim and uh, generally speaking, finding relief from the hot weather. Uh, pretty smart of this herd, something I don't see terribly commonly, but you can see those heat waves coming out of that view. The forest is always a great place to try and spend the day, and moose, of course, are no fools. They're staying out in the willows, in the riparian, the lakeside, creekside habitats. Both bulls and cows can be quite difficult to find in uh, upper 80, lower 90 degree temperatures. But if you stick to the river bottoms, you can have some degree of success. And uh, sure enough, we had quite a few views of moose this week, uh, but it had to be in the low country down by the rivers. Now, moose actually have very few mechanisms to stay cool. Uh, they have sweat glands in their hooves and they can pant, but that's, that's it. Anything in the upper 80 degree temperatures and a moose can be at risk for heat exhaustion. Uh, and so it's pretty important this time of year that these moose do their best to try and stay near these water sources. They are a concern, of course, with global climate change. It is, if our summers continue to get hotter, this is one of the species that could certainly struggle as a result of that and something we'll have to keep an eye on as we continue on into the future. But in the meantime, the moose are experts at staying cool here in Grand Teton, and we're doing quite well this week. Bison are actually experts at summer and warm conditions. As an animal that evolved on the Great Plains, they actually handle quite heat quite well and don't have a lot of the difficulty that we see in some of our other Grand Teton species. But that doesn't mean a good wallow in the mud doesn't feel good on a hot day. Um, as Sarah, our naturalist, explains while she's up in Yellowstone National Park. Hey there, it's Sarah with Eco Tours. We're safely ensconced in our van here, um, enjoying a moment with these bison. And I wanted to share these sunbathing bison with you. We posted a video of wolf pups playing with the day at the beach. And here we have a much more laid back beach day with these bison just sunbathing on the edge of the pond, living their best bison life. All right, so that was pretty fun. A big thanks to Josh, Tyler, Sarah, um, Taylor, Mike, Jeff, Laura, and Kelsey for all of that great footage this week of all of our hoofed mammals. Lots, lots going on out there. And that's what we have for this week's video content. So that means that it's time for my favorite, well, second favorite, my favorite is question answer, my second favorite part of each week's broadcast which is our trivia question of the week. So the way this is gonna work is you're gonna comment in the comment section if you know the answer to our trivia question. And if um, you get this week's question right, you get $10 to our Ecotours gift store. Now we started this gift store 
uh, during the COVID closure back in March to try and fund our employee health insurance. So if you'd like to help us out, check out our gift store. I'm sure Taylor in the comment section can absolutely um, give us a good look at uh, all the cool things that are in that store. One of my favorite things that we have on view this week is some of our Steo clothing wear. Steo is a local Jackson company. That's what we all wear when we guide trips and um, they've got some amazing outdoor wear. So go ahead and check out our um, Eco Tours store, help fund our health insurance. We certainly thank you for that, but let's get you guys some good questions. Okay, question number one is from last week. So you're not gonna get 10 bucks if you answer this one correctly, uh, but I'm gonna show it to you so that we can give an answer. And the question was that a male elk is called a bull, a Baby elk is called the calf. What is a female elk called? This is a photo I took up in um, Mammoth up in Yellowstone. I thought it was just kind of a funny image, so I thought it would be good to illustrate our question. Go ahead and answer in the comment section if you know, right? Okay, so a bull elk is a male. A calf elk is a young elk. What's a female elk called? Any guesses? The answer is a cow elk. It's a cow elk. Uh, when I was a kid, I loved knowing the names of the males and the females and the babies of the different species. In this particular case, um, it's just like a cow. A bull, a cow, and a calf makes it pretty easy for sure. Um, I think that's a pretty good one. I really enjoyed that one. Hopefully, tell me if that was too easy or too hard for you as a question. Uh, but I thought we'd stick with elk this week and I'd ask you, because I just talked about it in the video, so we'll see if you were listening, what is the name of the fuzzy covering that bull elk have on their antlers?
No sound. I'm so sorry about that, guys. Thank you for telling me. Oh, dear. I am so sorry about that. <laughs> I think we got it back. I think that was a technical malfunction on my end. Okay, what I was saying when I was going like this and you couldn't hear me was that I have a... Um, this is time for question and answer. So if you've got a wildlife biology, naturalist uh, related question for me, um, something, uh, anything you wanna ask about the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem, clouds, astronomy, you name it, um, go ahead and ask me in the comment section. I'm gonna look at my iPad here and see what the questions are and we'll see if we can't get you guys some answers. All right, let's see. Now, can everybody hear me now? I think you guys can, right? Just go ahead and confirm. Yay, okay, the sound is back. All right, Lee Thompson says, how late in the summer can a baby elk be born to make it through the winter? Lee, that's a really good question. Occasionally, we do see elk come into season at the wrong time. And uh, they can get bred any time of year. We'll sometimes even see calves born um, up into the winter. Generally speaking, they've got to have enough of a winter coat and they probably should not be nursing in order to survive the winter. So yeah, just about now would be the very latest I would want to see calves born. July maybe, um, the survivability rate of anything going in the winter that doesn't have good body fat um, is a problem. It's an additional problem if they can't get milk from mom and mom's no longer lactating because food is not as plentiful then. So yeah, I would obviously prefer to see them born in June. July's probably okay. Maybe early August, but probably not much later than that. So thanks very much for that question. Let's see what else we've got. Lots of correct answers on our trivia question. Let's see here. Don asks, on the barrel sow in Grand Teton, uh, I'm sorry, in Yellowstone National Park, why is her head that color? He's saying he thinks it's probably unusual. You are correct, that is unusual. And grizzly bear color is caused by incomplete dominance, which means trying to understand why a bear is one color versus another color unless you are a PhD geneticist, and even then, because it's not completely understood, is madness. Um, really, basically what happens when you have incomplete dominance is that means some hairs are one color, other hairs are another color, and then in addition, you can have different genetic situations like piebaldism, where a certain area of the body could be particularly light or particularly dark, or even birthmark um, situations where there's a, even large birthmarks can leave dark or light coloration. So as for the barrel sow in Yellowstone, she is a little strange looking, isn't she? She's a little bit unique, uh, but I don't know if we necessarily know why she's particularly that color other than it's either a circumstance of genetics or a circumstance of, um, you know, a, a birthmark or something that she was probably born with. It's not a scarring issue. Um, so great question. I'll see if I can't find out more, but I don't think anybody necessarily knows why she's sort of that strange color. So great question there. Let's see here. Rosemary asks, are bears susceptible to any infectious diseases or insect infestations? Rosemary, that's a great question. You always have really good questions for me. So thank you very much for that. I sure appreciate it. Um, yeah, they absolutely are subject to all sorts of different infestations. Uh, interestingly enough, they have some immunity to some things that would cause us to become ill. Because bears are um, carrion eaters, they can eat from carcasses that are well-aged, let's put it that way. Uh, they are actually relatively um, resistant to a lot of the problems that um, overgrowth of bacteria in muscle tissue or meat that's been left out would make us sick. So if you were to cook uncooked meat, you might get E. coli or salmonella. These are not things that typically would affect bears or wolves for that matter. Um, and for that reason, they don't typically 
affect dogs either domestic dogs although they can under the right circumstances bears also don't suffer from a lot of the protozoa complaints that we might have things like say giardia or um, cryptosporidium not a problem for a grizzly bear they're pretty resistant to those things um, but they can of course get parasites mange can be an issue with bears where um, the 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 mange parasite is living right at the base of their hair causes them to be incredibly itchy they'll itch and they'll actually lose their coat that can be quite dangerous if they lose enough of their coat that they can't stay warm in the winter that's something that seems to affect wolves and coyotes far more than bears but it certainly can affect them um, they certainly can get um, all sorts of other kinds of diseases and growths and tumors and the other things that any mammal is susceptible to. So while they don't get everything that we necessarily get, um, they can uh, certainly get sick from a variety of different bacterial, viral infections. Um, no evidence that bears can get COVID-19, although uh, there's been some conversation about that just because, of course, zoo bears living in cities could be susceptible. We know dogs under very rare circumstances um, have had the illness, but it hasn't necessarily had the same effect as it has on people. Um, anything in sort of that predatory mammal family, it's possible, um, although certainly we're not seeing any signs of it in cats. Um, bears and dogs are a little closer related to each, to each other than cats are. It's a whole nother branch of the sort of carnivora family. So um, interesting question for sure. You bring up a lot of interesting questions about what they can and can't get. Um, sort of a funny side note, I studied under a anesthesiologist in veterinary medicine when I was in college and among other things he was one of the first people to sedate um, and anesthetize a polar bear for open heart surgery. In the old days they used to feed bears just a straight meat diet in zoos. They just would give them raw meat because they thought that's what bears needed. Well, bears, of course, are omnivores. 80% of their diet in a grizzly bear is vegetation. And so it caused them to have um, congested arteries and they would get heart disease and they would die uh, early deaths from having clogged arteries. Imagine if you just ate McDonald's morning, noon, and night. Uh, you probably <laughs> would have that problem as well. Now bears get a much better diet. They live much, much longer in captivity than they once did. But it's just as interesting to me uh, that bears used to suffer from that just like people do in zoos just from an inappropriate and improper diet. Uh, side note on that story, as the veterinary anesthesiologist tells it, the polar bear woke up in the middle of the open heart surgery because they didn't dose him correctly and they ended up having to um, knock him back out so they could finish the surgery and the polar bear did survive but uh, we're getting a little far afield there. So great question there, thank you very much. Let's see what else we've got here. Hang on. Gosh, folks are joining us from all over. It's so fun to see all the places. Everybody is joining us fun. That's really fun. Let's see here. asks any wolverines in the park? Stady, great question. Yes, we do have wolverines, probably in both Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Park. There have been a couple different studies that have been done most re recently by the Rocky Mountain Conservation Cooperative, and their results were, like every wolverine study, not exactly precise, but it's thought that we probably have uh, a few wolverines in Yellowstone National Park um, and maybe one or two in Grand Teton. So certainly less than 10 would probably be a good surmise. I haven't read that paper for a while, but I, I gather, I think they've thought maybe two or three in Grand Teton and maybe slightly more in Yellowstone, as I recall. Uh, and so not very many. Now the problem is it's really hard to find wolverines. So uh, understanding how many of them there are, understanding their population is really a struggle. There are folks who think we probably have less than 100 wolverines, certainly less than 150 in the continental United States at this point, and they probably almost certainly should be an endangered species, but we don't know how many of them there are, 
And you gotta know how many of them there are in order to declare them an endangered species. So we can't actually get the scientific data together to have enough information because they're such an elusive animal. Um, modern advances in camera trapping technology, they're actually able to insert a chip uh, GPS tracking chip into one wolverine who then proceeded to go right over the top of the Tetons almost in the dead of winter. Uh, these things are helping us to understand the species a little bit better. Um, certainly they rely on things like bighorn sheep in the winter. Uh, the carcasses of bighorn sheep are a really important food source for them. So as our bighorn sheep population in Grand Teton National Park declines, there's concerns about wolverines and whether they're going to be able to continue to survive in the dead of winter at high altitude with uh, not enough carrion to eat. So great question. The short answer is we're not exactly sure, but there's definitely some, hard to say how many. So that's a good one. Oh my gosh, Laura, one of our guides, you saw some of her video earlier. She says, I saw a baby bison being born today. So Lee, uh, that's gonna be a tough, tough road to survive for that baby bison for the winter. Possible, anything's possible. Um, I've certainly seen some very, very young elk and some very, very young bison make it through the winter. So possible. Uh, but oof, it's getting awfully late for animals to be born. So thanks about, thanks for that, Laura. Let's see here. All right. I think, I think that's all the questions that we've got for the week. So that was pretty fun. You guys got me some really good ones this week. I thoroughly enjoyed that. I hope everybody had a great time watching all of that awesome video footage. I hope you guys have a really safe, fantastic week, a wild weekend. And I will see you all next Wednesday. A big thanks to the Travel and Tourism Board of Teton County for grant funding this project so that we can share Jackson Hole with the world. We really appreciate it. And I am so excited to show you some of the great stuff we've got coming up next week. So long, everyone. Bye-bye.